We make provisions for the unknown to the extent that we are able. That's pretty light. All right, guys, three gang new work switch box. It's gonna tuck right here, tight in the corner. And actually, we're gonna modify it just a little bit. So I'm gonna saw this edge off with my sawzall. Cuts pretty easily. Could be famous last words. Height is good. Okay. I want to get a half inch reveal. I've got my screws. And I don't want it to be cocked in or out. So what I'm tempted to do right now is put a screw through the box. That, that is a code violation. Um, so I want that to not be hanging outside of the drywall in the final equation. Not, not, not. So, ah, this is awkward. <laughs> there we go. There's my third hand. Come on. Oh. Field engineering, right into my hand. <laughs> Boom, super grab. I'm gonna do one on the back side too. Okay, so the box flipping and flopping, hanging out of the wall. So we added a tiny little block here Secure the box on both sides. Half inch reveal for drywall. Beautiful. I'm gonna pound this in. Take it back to half inch. I'm gonna have some play in the switches, but I do wanna make sure that's a level plane because if I get it cocked, <clears throat> not real forgiving on the finish out. Here's a tight spaces trick. This is an old timer trick right here. Use your pliers, the side that's not the hinge side. So look at how it operates. Do not pound on the hinge side. Stick them in there if you don't have enough swing space and essentially transfer There it is. Boom. Just transfer your point out about an inch so you have a clear swing. Or you could use a screw or whatever. Lots of ways to overcome. All right, I'm going to pop these flaps out of the box. Not completely out, just, just loose. I need about, I'm going to have a hot in, a hot out. That's two cables. I'm going to have three switch legs. That's a total of five. So I'm going to knock five flaps free. One, two, three, four. And every one, every switch leg is gonna enter at the designated location. So, so normally, we drill the top plate, but in this case, the shower ceiling is dropped. So I've got this whole cavity to run wiring through because this is the plane of the shower ceiling. All right, switch legs number two and three. I've got some wire I'm reusing here. Again, it is in excellent shape. That is the only reason. I would entertain using it. And we're gonna run to the toilet wafer light. So I'm plugging in at my slot for switch leg number two. That's the middle position. That's toilet. I want nine inches in the box, quarter inch of outer insulation in the box. Up and over we go. Through my drop ceiling. Drop ceiling space. It's not an acoustical drop ceiling, guys. Don't think that. It's not, not in a bathroom, not in a house. It's not that crazy. All right. So this is enough wire here to make it happen. <clears throat> I'm gonna label. 
we're going to call it toilet wafer. So on the finish out, this is going to get drywalled over. See, this is just a whip. Toilet wafer. On the finish out, we're going to cut our hole right in the center of this ceiling space. We're going to reach up right there between edge and edge. We're going to cut that four inch hole to match the wafer size. We're going to reach up and we're going to pull this wire out of the ceiling. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And just in case plans change or the sequence of events gets out of whack, I am going to put a wire net on that because it could presumably, possibly, potentially become energized up there in the ceiling. So we're going to put it right there. Boom shakalaka, as the old saying goes. And then, this is our home run feed. When we demoed the wire, we labeled it home run because we toned it out, figured out what was going on here. It's not hot right now. I'm gonna drop it through into our switch box because it's bringing the power feed. All right, now this one I'm gonna make extra long. I'm gonna take everything I've got here and I'm gonna strip back <clears throat> seriously like 20 inches because that hot jumper is going to energize every switch in that box and the hot going out into the next box so there are four stops that this one conductor is going to make and I'm going to do all of that without a single wiring connection because every additional wiring connection is a potential point of failure so that's my hot. I'm gonna bring it through here, just kind of keeping it neat and tidy. I'm gonna bring it in on the far end because it's literally just gonna go sequentially and hit switch number one, switch number two, switch number three, and the other hot feed. So there it is. Boom, all that. I'm also, <clears throat> just for my own purposes, this is my own communication method, you should have your own, gonna put a flag on that. See that piece of colored tape, that's a flag. And that's just an additional indicator that <clears throat> this is the guy. This is my hot feed for everything. All right, now we're bringing in this shower switch leg in position number three, or one actually. One is closest to the door. There we are, one, one to nine inches, everything matches. That's just gonna bring a little bit of additional order to our box. And in the shower, we've got wet location rated wafer lights. These were selected by the homeowner. I think it's a really nice choice. And so I'm gonna have an additional, uh, I just want it to come through there, just for sake of being neat and tidy. All right, so same thing that we did above the stool. We've got just a little bit of slack here that we'll, we'll manage. We'll put a service loop down there. But we don't know where these wafer lights are going. That's the thing. Homeowner has not made final selections. In fact, we might not know until the tile is complete because it could be like, well, you know, it fits better here or there, you know, just depending on the tile, aesthetics. It's at the homeowner's pleasure. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna label this with Sharpie sh wafer just so there's no confusion when we come back. We're gonna take this end and we're gonna twist it to another end. And we're gonna leave two uh, tails or whips up there ready to wire into the wafer. See, wherever we cut on the finish out, we can reach up, we can reach across this drop ceiling, we can pull it to where it needs to go. We just wanna make sure we have plenty of slack. All right. <clears throat> Plenty of wire, looks like two feet, two feet's plenty. I'm just gonna literally take these, twist them together. That way if I find one, I find them both. I'm gonna cap the one that could become energized. That's right here. Again, depending on the sequence of events. A lot of times we'll put temporary power switches and temporary lights into a space like this that doesn't have any natural light and that's gonna allow construction lighting in a convenient manner. 
so things may become energized. We're gonna put that up there. We're not worried about this end being capped because it's not connected until the lights go in. And we're gonna label this as well, just because labeling equals professionalism. You never know what might happen. We could have a tile guy up here messing around with stuff. We could have the homeowner, framer, modifications down the road. I'm gonna put that right up there. And uh, I'm gonna put two staples on it very lightly because I wanna be able to pull them out later if, I, if I, I'm fishing and, and moving things around. And those light staples are just gonna keep this from falling out of the ceiling. Easy does it. <laughs> the staples are in lightly enough that if I yank on that wire, it'll pop them out and I'll be free, but at least it's not gonna be bothering anyone down in their space. Let's run the jumper. We are routing our wire overhead through the bathroom down to bringing a hot feed to the second switch box. I'm not gonna leave much slack up there, but I am gonna leave some, because that wafer light, if it falls right on that wire and that's tight, is gonna do nothing but get in my way. So just, again, a little bit of slack. Look at that, some of you are gonna hate that, because it looks sloppy, but I'm telling you, it's smart. So this wire, is connected to our home run at our previous switch box. Coming overhead and down the wall. What I need is a hole at the top of the wall. That's where this tight, tighter angle comes in play. And I need to cut in for my two gang switch box right here. So here it goes. I'm gonna cheat way, 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 way to the front of that top plate so I don't come out of the back side of the wall in the master bedroom. So I'm gonna drill at a steep angle. I'm gonna correct the angle as much as possible as I go. And then I'm gonna nail plate the face of that because I won't be a code compliant distance between the wire and the face of drywall. It'll be too shy. Ooh. There it is. That's a smaller bit. I'm gonna go ahead and drill two of those so I've got enough wiring paths for my hot in, hot out, and two switch lights out. That's a total of four cables in this box. There it is. So my hole's at an angle, right? It's coming out probably about the center of that top plate, that double top plate. So what I did was I removed, whew. Yeah, I did put them a little too far apart. I could have been smarter about that, but I could have been smarter about a lot of things, you know what? I removed the drywall so I could apply this nail plate. The nail plate is specified by code, it's a 16, 16th inch thick steel. It's got two little prongs that I'm gonna nail into the wood. It's gonna provide my protection. I'm actually, because my whole spacing is kind of awkward, I'm gonna pinch down the one prong. I'm gonna use the second. I'm gonna put it on vertically and that's gonna provide beautiful, beautiful protection to my wire. Nail plates can also look like this. A little bit different, same concept. I'm gonna just pinch that down out of the way. I'm gonna put it on vertically. There it is. Protecting my wire from a stray drywall screw. 
Let's cut the hole. What we did is we selected the location, the measurement off floor to the bottom of the box, box to wall, pencil, and trace the perimeter. Let's cut. You know what, I'm gonna take some caulk. Oh, there's a ton of drywall work being done in here, so I'm not too concerned about uh, small blemishes and things of that nature because everything's gonna get patched and painted, but I am gonna go ahead and probe the wall, make sure we're in the clear, hit it at the corners, back and forth action, make sure, yep, it's beautiful. Confirming the depth, that depth in contrast to my box. We're in great shape. I actually hold my blade at the depth of the cut that I need so that I have comfortable action. And what that does is if you have a brand new razor sharp saw, I've actually had apprentices that have punched through this side of the wall and the other side of the wall. And now we're paying for a patch job and a paint job, 250 bucks in, no bueno. So literally, I'm grabbing the blade on purpose. And that's just limiting the cut. There it is. There's insulation, that's an interior wall. The reason for insulation is soundproofing. Maybe they fart real loud or something. <laughs> All right, broski, more of my right angle drill action across the ceiling here. <clears throat> We're gonna, I'm gonna fish everything down from the top and out the hole here. That is a small target to hit. Going up the wall, psh, way too difficult. So I'm gonna run it this way first. This is a hot, this is a modern 12 to 20 amp wire that's gonna carry my hot from here to the closet lights. Now here's a quick code thing. <clears throat> the outlets in this bathroom need to be a dedicated 20 amp circuit with nothing else, just the outlets. But there are a couple exceptions there. One you can share the outlets of this bathroom with the outlets of another bathroom. Two, you can share the outlets of this bathroom with the lights of this bathroom. But you can do one, not both. Take your pick. In this case, we had three circuits coming into the bathroom. So one is 20 amp dedicated to outlets. Boom, spot on. Second is 20 amp dedicated to lights. Overkill, but no problem there. And the third is actually going into the master closet because we wanted to put it on by itself to avoid having a technical code violation with one master closet receptacle tied into the bathroom receptacles. So we've got the bases covered. I'm gonna use some existing holes here. Always check the back side of your framing. So you don't hit a water line or something. Ooh, yeah, we can do that. I think we have a wiring path. We've got plenty of existing holes we can utilize. So, hot feed. Continuing from location number one to location number two. Now from location number two, to location number three. This is a 12-2, that means I'm carrying a hot, a neutral, and a ground. That's the third conductor, but that's not a current carrying conductor. So it's excluded from the count. I'm gonna use this wire to hold those wires up and out of my space. Too much. Just tuck it in there for safekeeping. Route that later. I'm gonna move my ladder. Pull the slack back. Boom! I like it. All right. Woo! Hello. There we are. Rocking and rolling, making wages. Now I need my switch legs. And I'm going primary lighting is gonna go right through the center of the ceiling here. We're gonna have a total of three wafer lights. I'm actually not even gonna cut this wire this time. I'm gonna run the wafers continuously and I'm gonna label them with Sharpie everywhere I think they're gonna go. I'm gonna give myself the highest likelihood of success. I'm gonna leave some slack. I'm gonna label my wire 
And if the missus changes her mind, guess what? Base is covered. All right, <clears throat> so we think that the light stops on this side of the beam or maybe just on the beam. What I'm doing is I'm going through and sending the end of that wire to the other side just in case something changes. The cabinets don't show up as expected and that moves two inches. I'm now not on the blind side of the beam. I've been taken care of. I am gonna cap this lightly like we've been doing because you just never know. We make provisions for the unknown to the extent that we are able. That's pretty light. So if I'm here and I need to pull that back through on the finish out, I'm just gonna yank that, wire nut's gonna pop off and I'll have the end of the wire. So that is a provision right there I don't think I will need. But 12 inches of wire is about 50 cents. That, that's a healthy loop right there. <clears throat> no more, no less. I'm gonna put a light staple right there. Again, I want that staple to pop out if I need it to. If I need that slack, if something changes, if I end up in the next bay over from what was anticipated and laid out with the homeowner. But, light staple. There it is, right there. Let's label it wafer. You just never know. Construction projects come with the warning subject to change without notice. Here's another method. I've got a third wafer right there. Two separate cables. I'm gonna tape the ends together. If I find one, I find them both. Just a little bit to ensure nothing gets lost. I'm gonna label wafer. I'm gonna tuck that loop up there. Let's do, let's do that. I'm gonna put that staple on there. Another loose staple right there. Hold things in place. There it is. I'm gonna come back at the end and clean things up. Anything that's hanging below the drywall, put some good clean staples in it, but I'm not worried about that just yet. Uh, that's the final. Stapling is the final thing besides sweeping up. Second switch leg is going to my vanity lights, my bathroom vanity lights. See what I'm doing here is I'm uncoiling my wire, taking the twist out. It's gonna pull smoothly. It's gonna look better if I just reverse the twist. So here's, here's the thought. Leaving the two gang switch box, the closest vanity light is gonna be a pendant here. Second one is across the bathroom. I'm gonna hit the second one first. I'm gonna take the longer route and double back. The reason for that is intentional. That vanity light has been placed at a very specific location, that center and center on the vanity. That cannot move. That lands right on a two by six joist. I'm gonna use a pancake box, half inch thick box, that it's gonna allow me to screw to the face of that joist, end up flush with drywall just like I want to, but there's a max wire fill. Max wire fill is one of these babies in that box. So I can't go in and back out. I've gotta to go to the far vanity which is gonna be an inch and a half deep box, plenty of space, and then come back and hit the pancake. Code compliance, a little bit more effort, worth it. I'm gonna label all these wires. I've got four of them. Three of them are identical before I fish them down the wall. And I'm not quite ready to do that, but this is Vanity Lights. V-A-N, Vanity. <clears throat> this one, is uh, hot. H-O-T, 
feeding from one box to the next, carrying my main hot, my main neutral. That's like the chunk line. And then this one, I'm just checking each one of them. Be methodical. I'm not good at methodical, but I need to be. This one is wafer. So when I fish them down the wall, I know exactly what they are. <clears throat> Keeping the labels, labeling the heck out of stuff. You might ask, hey, what's the optimal hole size to drill through the joists? That's a great question. The answer to that question is the smallest hole that allows you to easily get your job done. You're going to have a max hole size that can go in every framing member before it needs nail plates or structural reinforcement. Usually with electrical work and small wiring like this, that's not even a question. It's more about how many conductors you put in the hole. Basic easy rule of thumb, which is overly conservative in some cases, is three cables in one board hole like that max. Um, and these fit easily. So if your wiring fits without damaging the insulation, if you can pull smoothly and you max out at three, you're good to go. You're safe. You're, you're playing it cautiously. You're not going to run into problems. All right, quick tip, Romex, this kind of stuff, needs to be secured within every four and a half feet. That's the max distance it can span without being secured, but there are a couple exceptions. Exception number one, or interpretation rather, is every place that passes through a board hole like this, by the code, that's counted as being secured and supported. Spot on. Second is where it's fished in voids and cavities. Like we're about to fish it down the wall to that two gang switch box. It is not required to be supported or secured. So where it goes through the board hole at the top of the wall, supported and secured. Where it fishes down the wall, not so much. Hey, somebody look, at, look that up for me. Is it just horizontal holes that are counted as supporting and securing or vertical also? Check the link in the description or the code reference. So here we're going to add this box, a nice labor saving invention to this space above the, the vanity and the missus of the house is not positive that there's going to be just one pendant. It could move, it could change, yeah, she's just trying to feel through that right now. So again, we're going to leave plenty of wire, uh, hopefully she's got a final decision before drywall. Um, we're going to go ahead and mount our box put it up there with what she thinks she wants. We are going to account, I lost my hammer. We are gonna account for drywall, that there's gonna be half inch thickness drywall on this face and this face. So our measurements consider that. Um, to center on vanity, we're gonna be 15 and a half off this wall to center of box, nine off this wall to center of box. So we're gonna locate that, mark it up, screw in our box. All right, so see what we've got here is overlapping joist tails, and this is too long. So we're gonna have to modify this box, which is fine. I'm literally gonna cut it with the sawzall there with a fine metal blade, and that's gonna shorten. Uh, there's uh, three inches of overlap. I'm gonna cut off the overlap, and that's gonna shorten shorten it up by three inches, make sure that's enough. Yeah, all I need is an inch and a half, so I'll be fine. Here's a lousy dry, uh, metal blade. It's all dull here from cutting some stainless steel strut. So I'm gonna use the teeth on the end. That's kind of awkward, but in the, in the old days, I'd be using a hacksaw, so I'm even thankful to have a uh, sawzall. <clears throat> if I was Paul Bunyan, I'd be using my teeth. So one thing I need to do is, um, the elevation has got to be right. So I've got a half inch reveal. Again, that's my drywall, my half inch drywall. Can't forget that. I've seen so many, like number one apprentice mistake is the nail and box right there.
that one's kind of interesting. A lot of pancake boxes will have a more varied hole pattern, but this has got one mounting hole in the center, and then the other two come into play when you mount the fixture itself. So, and we can't add blocking to this side because that blocking will interfere. No, 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 uh, it might, might interfere there. Let's see what we got, let's see if. So what we encountered here is the pancake box is limited in its mounting options. One hole in the center of the box. The center of the box falls just off framing. And so I'm adding half inch OSB to the edge of framing, right where the box will be located. And then we'll have something to screw the box into. Guys, this is not my usual MO. I'm an electrician. I don't use shims. <laughs> I'm never buying this box again. It's a shim. I'm shimming the box. It's gonna be a half inch. It's gonna be beautiful. Spot on, dialed in. That's it. All right. There it is, plenty of extra wire. Cable clamp. Only one cable in the shallow fan box. Uh, that's plenty. We're gonna leave it, leave the jacket on it just to help protect it a little bit more from roto zips and the likes thereof. We're gonna leave a service loop in there. 12 inch max. Because this little flap does count as a clamp from a code perspective. We're gonna go ahead and support this wiring while we're here with a three quarter inch staple. Keep it up and off drywall. Oh, no accidental damages. Let's straighten that up. That's it. Keep it tucked tight. We've got the excess right there. That's very intentional because the missus needs the latitude to call the lighting shots. I'm gonna be coming in on the back side of the installation because the, the entry hole is at an angle. I'm gonna have to reach through the installation. It's a good time to be wearing gloves, fighting this fiberglass. Not there yet. Aha, look at that. Boom. That's what we're looking for. All right, <clears throat> let's tie our wires on. Pick, pick two, any two. Just disentangle this. These two feel the most natural, just because of how they're sitting up there when they exit the hole. Use that electrician's tape. I tell you what, if you use any other kind of tape, it doesn't have the stretch and flex that electrician's tape does. And even if it's sticky, like duct tape, those wires might just pop out under strain. Don't use scotch, don't use masking. Use electrician's tape. The home team's gonna win this one. There it is. All right. A little bit up top. A little bit of slack we like to always see. 12 inches down here is plenty. Rinse and repeat, round two. So at this point, we're gonna terminate our box. Oh. Remove all our tape. Get that out of here. Boom. And we want to maintain the labels we've got. So I'm going to maintain them on the box. Let's think about this. If switch number one closest to the door is overhead lights, we're going to call that wafer. And I'm going to pencil W-A-F. Sharpie right in there. Then we're gonna have hot and hot. It does not matter which one is incoming and which one is outgoing, that's interchangeable. And then we're gonna have vanity, V-A-N. And that's how I'm gonna pull my wires into this box. Now we pre-punch oh, our hole, our knockouts. 
in the top of the box. I feel like these knockouts are just way too tight, in my opinion. Have to fight them a little bit. Way too tight. Use your onboard pry bar. It's there. Make sure it's level. You can feel those tabs. You need a quarter turn for the tab to open up and grab drywall. You can feel it move. There is insulation, so you have to watch out because that insulation, if it resists the tab from opening, prevents that. The tab stays flat and the box pops out of the wall sometime down the road. You get a call back from the homeowner. Ugh. Not death grip, it's just holding the drywall. Boom. Everything's labeled. Everything's evident. Everything's visible. And we just go ahead and tuck it into the wall for now. You can do more pre-work at this point. You can strip your wires, combine your neutrals, crimp your grounds, but it's not, not necessary. Really can't decide if there's an advantage to doing that now during the rough-in or not because, like I said, everything here is real straightforward. We've got no gotchas. Everything's labeled. Yeah. So this scope of work that we've done, when you're considering both rough-in and finish-out work, the return trip, permitting excluded, mobilization costs excluded, we're looking at six switches across three locations, 14 total lights, a total of about $1,500. About 60% of that work is done on the rough-in and 40% on the finish out, maybe a bit less. What we do is we bill 75% on the rough-in because we want to be a few dollars ahead. There are those smart homeowners out there that want to either hire another electrician to finish out or do it themselves, which is most likely to save a few bucks and you want to be a few dollars ahead, not a few dollars behind if you find yourself splitting the difference with the homeowner. Be sure to check our video on common mistakes and finishing out this space where we trim it out switches, devices, lights, and you get to see the finished product.